we are live. Welcome to Ju Media live interview. My name is Ching Ju. Today, my special guest is Sean Savage. He's a mastering engineer. And let's welcome Sean. Hi, Sean. Hi, Ching. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am spectacular. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much. And we are slightly late and sorry for people watching us. And so did you figure out <laughs> what's the reason <laughs> for for the audio situation? Yeah, it, it, I just hooked up a new mixer and I, I didn't do the mix minus properly, but mm. I figured it out. Great. Thank you so much. So tell me, where are you right now? I'm in Toronto, Canada. That's where I live. Wow. Awesome. Canadian. So, yep. yeah, yeah. So tell me about what is, or tell people, audience, if we don't know, what is a mastering engineer difference from a sound engineer or someone is working on sound, like in film or recording? Okay, so I do all of that, actually. So I, I can break it down. When you're talking about the hierarchy of, of engineers, of audio engineers, the mastering engineer is usually at the top, and then you'll have like a mixing engineer. And then the mixing engineer can do music or podcast or voiceovers or films or anything else. And then you have a recording engineer whose just job is to get things recorded and then hand it off to the mixing engineer, and then it goes to the mastering engineer. So a lot of people think mastering is this sort of black art and they don't know a lot of what goes on. And as far as the history of it, when I went, I went to engineering school and when I got out of engineering school, I kind of did the reverse. I started as a mastering engineer. Most people start as a mixing engineer and work their way up, but I was lucky enough to intern at a mastering studio and learn it right from the get go. So the origins of what a mastering engineer actually is, is it started with records, with vinyl. So you would go and get the record pressed onto vinyl, but there's a, a sort of limited bandwidth for a record. And if you don't manage the highs and the lows effectively, what happens is when you start cutting the lathe on the record, if there's too much bass, it'll pop off and it won't cut the record and you won't get a record. So initially what a mastering engineer did was make sure the bass was in a certain place and there was enough highs. And then we would apply a special EQ. It's called the RIAA EQ. And what that is, is just sort of a reverse EQ to make sure it plays back on your stereo, on your record player, that sort of thing. So initially it was just, here's your reel to reel tape you got from the studio and we need to put it on a record, but it's got to go through. And the mastering and engineer would just kind of dial in and make sure it was a smooth recording on the actual record. Now, when CDs came along, there was a whole other thing. And that's where I kind of jumped in. I learned how to do cut the records and do that. But when CDs came in, it was this whole race because, you know, when you put a CD into your CD changer, you have, you know, album number one, and then you go, okay, let me listen to album number two, and it would change and would go to the next CD, but then the volume would be completely a different level. So something called the loudness wars. So the goal there with mastering, and I did a lot of record label stuff, was, okay, we want ours louder than the next guy. So it was this whole art of making it as loud as possible, but not having it be distorted on a CD. And I know you probably know this too. As human beings, we like analog tape. We like the sound of analog tape. And CDs sometimes can sound harsh. The reason for that is a CD can reproduce 20 hertz to 20K. It re re reproduce all the frequencies that we hear. And tape, an analog gear, can only reproduce from 20 hertz to 16K. So there's that from 16 to 20K, it's kind of rolled off. But we like that because it sounds nice and warm. It, it's just like pink noise, right? And what 
we hear on a CD is all of that. So a lot of people say they like analog better than digital. So that was happening. But now that we've gotten away from that with the streaming services, they all have different loudness requirements, but we can get into, you know, having it sit where it's good. And what a mastering engineer's job is, is to make sure your song, after it gets mixed, it comes to me, and I have to make sure it sounds good on every system. So on a little tiny speaker, it needs to sound good in your car, and it's some, it's what we call translation. So the song needs to translate on all different systems, even on a little tiny speaker where you can only hear the mid-range, it needs to sound good. And then when you play it on a in a big club, it needs to sound good. So our goal is to make sure the song can translate to different systems. And that's why I love Dolby Atmos, which, which is where we are now. There's only one loudness. And if you don't give it to them, you get rejected. So the job of a mastering engineer is to make things sound good on all systems. We coordinate a lot with the mixing engineer and the artist to make their song to sound better. Hmm. Wow, that's a very uh, exclusive, uh, complete, nice uh, explanation. Now, um, we talk about a little bit of sound uh, before, and it's very interesting. You mentioned that the the frequency, the vibration for string uh, for us uh, string players uh, now it used to be four four zero, and now many orchestra go to four four two, and you said. Uh, 388, right? That's what you say? 432. 432, sorry. 432 actually is uh, more resonant. So tell me a little bit more about that because, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a late night on Clubhouse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, which is where we met. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the equal temper tuning, that sort of tuning for your, your concert pitch and your, your A440, Back in the, with chamber music and Beethoven and, and all of, when all classical music, as you're well aware, was was being created and all of that stuff, a lot of the orchestras, the the Gregorian chants, the choirs, mm -hmm. the quartets, all of them, they would tune and they would be going around Europe and again, Mozart, Beethoven, all the, they would be tuning to A being 432. And uh, having it get tuned up came about during World War II. And, you know, Germany was probably the main pusher of that to have everything go up to 440. And that's where I'm at. Like, I understood, you know, 432 compared to 440. And I've done a lot of testing. And I just find it's more resonant. And it, it just connects better emotionally. And when I hear... 440 again, it kind of starts sounding out of tune. But I wasn't aware of what you were talking about, about going up from 440. I was only aware about going down to 432. So where did where did your experience come from that? I'm going to ask you the question now to going up from 440, because I, I hadn't heard that before. Yeah, um, many orchestras starting to tune uh, their strings to 442. Of course, the whole orchestra has to go higher and it's just a little bit more um edgy more intense than 440 to to me i prefer 442 now i'm used to it so the the key factor being mm -hmm. they both agree 440 is not good <laughs> i wouldn't say it's not <laughs> well i don't know if it's not good it's a more traditional way of tuning and 442, it's a little bit edgy. And I, I go with your ears, go with your feeling. And yeah. we, we're both acknowledging that the feeling isn't there uh -huh. with 440. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Any, anymore. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, I, I also heard rumor that some other orchestra, they tune their orchestra to 445. Oh, they're even going up. Yeah. I, again, further away yeah. from 440. Yes, yes. Yeah. Up or down. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Anyway, it's interesting. So so tell me a little about how did you get into this audio business? Were you a musician? Do you play instrument? How did this whole thing uh, 
Okay, that. so the my first instrument was the recorder mm. when I was a little kid. Mm. Then I graduated to the accordion. I actually took accordion lessons. I had this great green, this red accordion, and uh, you know, playing the accordion it was a cool thing. But then I kind of got bored with that. It, it it got associated with not being cool, which is completely dumb. I disagree with that. But at the time, I didn't know any better because it was like okay. And then I just stopped doing that. And, you know, I loved music. I would listen to music. I would do all of that. And then at elementary school, we had concert band. So I got into the choir and I figured out I could sing. But then in concert band, the instrument they they gave me, I didn't want, I wanted the saxophone. Mm. But I was given the clarinet. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, yeah, the recorder clarinet same fingering ah, okay and it's still a reed instrument so i'm like okay i'm not a saxophone but i'm i'm, I'm getting there yeah and uh, I, I i experimented with drums and that sort of thing so then after elementary school so now this is high school grade nine concert band comes up again and i know i was playing clarinet but i didn't want to and i said saxophone and i got the saxophone finally in alto in grade in grade nine and i was so excited and i was like oh it's same fingering um, open hole close hole same embouchure mm -hmm. reed instrument and then i went to town on just being cool and having that cool instrument at the same time i learned how to play drums and then i hated music theory i hate music theory <laughs> but then i i started and i have to emphasize this I play the piano, but I'm not a piano player. Mm. Big difference for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I learned how to play the piano. And then, wonder of wonders, playing the alto, I'm like, oh, but that's not really the cool one. The tenor is the cool saxophone that all the cool people play. Mm -hmm. And then I went, well, it's the same fingering. Mm -hmm. So I learned the tenor. I learned the alto. I learned the soprano, all those saxes. Soprano looks like a clarinet, but it's it's a sax, right? And then I went, oh, wait a minute. The flute has the same fingering. Is it? Just, it's just a different embouchure. Wow. So then I learned how to play flute. So let's do the tally. So vertical, horizontal. <laughs> exactly. So let's do the tally. So I play all the saxes. I played the bar baritone as well, all the same fingering. Um, flute and then drums. Uh -huh. Uh, uh, again, I'm a drum player. I play, sorry, I play drums. I'm not a drummer. Mm -hmm. And piano, I play piano, but I'm not a piano player. Uh -huh. And just having music immerse in me. So as I got through high school and I finished, mm -hmm. I started DJing. Mm -hmm. And then I started learning more and more music. And I figured out my music teacher in high school before I graduated, we're doing a bunch of exercises. And uh, I figured out, he told me, he's like, you have perfect pitch. I'm like, what? He goes, tell me what note this is. Don't look. And I told him, he goes, tell me the." So he's like, you have perfect pitch. You Cause do? I could, oh cause I could hear, I could hear things and they sound sour to me. Yeah. That's the only way to describe it. It's sour. It's not yeah. pure. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, that's how you tell if something's out of tune. Yeah. Cause I know we talked previously about relative pitch and absolute, yeah. right? Yeah. So for me, I have absolute and then I could, I could, distinguish different different things yeah. but then i started djing uh -huh. and you know doing parties and that sort of thing but once i graduated from high school yeah. the my family business is law yeah. so my grandfather's a judge my grandmother's a judge my uncle's a lawyer my yeah. dad's a doctor mom's an accountant so it's like you're gonna do law and yeah. i was on the debating team and i did all that so i went to law school for one year mm. i took a year deferment then I went to production school, engineering school, and that was only one year, a, a diploma. So I said, look, if I take a deferment, go to engineering school, and you know, I can always go back to law school and finish, right? Mm -hmm. Never happened yeah. because I went to engineering school. I started doing remixes for labels. I started touring. I was doing touring and DJing all over the world before it was a big thing to do. Oh. And then you know, doing all the remixes for the record labels, being a mastering engineer, then doing it for other people. And then I started 
being a mastering engineer. So I mastered a lot of dance music, which is what I specialize in because I came from being a DJ mm -hmm. and then doing remixes for big artists and just fully immersed in the dance music scene. And then I have two record labels and I produce my own music, but a lot of my time is spent mixing and mastering music for other electronic artists. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the two labels, then I started teaching. So I was a professor at a recording arts mm -hmm. school here in Toronto. I created the program and I ran that for 10 years. So that might explain maybe why I kind of explain things well. Yeah, you definitely, you, you, you should go back to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I did uh, finish, I yeah. got the degree, I'm just not practicing now. So I went back and got that degree. So I write my own contracts and I can help people with contracts, but I'm not actually practicing. Wow. And uh, once I, I stopped teaching, I opened up my own school yeah. and I, had, I did that for uh, two years after I left the college. And now I just have my own company. We do post-production for podcasters. I'm on the radio. I'm on a commercial station here in Toronto and I do post-production on the radio station too. So I'm a technical producer for radio station. So currently what I'm doing is helping people with their audiobooks, helping people with their podcasts. I'm on the radio and I do post-production for radio st shows. So that's where kind of we fit in when we met on Clubhouse. That's what I'm doing on Clubhouse. I'm helping people get better audio if they have a podcast, if they have an audiobook. But I still have my record labels, still have my radio show, and I'm creating new music currently. And still helping people if, if they're looking for it to mix their songs to remix them and you know make a dance version of the original or mastering i mean a lot of people still want a human being to actually master their music it, it does make a difference thank you for explaining and thank you for yeah being very generous to be with us and on tuesday night um yeah so Tell us your clubhouse uh, time. Oh, you also have another time, Friday afternoon, 5 p.m. Oh, yeah. So on Clubhouse, I'm part of the Podcast Pros house. That's the name of the house. And Tuesdays at 5 p.m. Eastern, we do a regular room. Thursdays at 5 p.m., we do a regular room. And then on Fridays at 5 p.m., we do a regular room, and I do that room. The other two rooms, I'm the co-host for it. And basically... Because with my company, I'm dealing with my customers every day, helping them do their podcast, doing the post-production. So what I do on Clubhouse is I just talk to people about the things we're going through on a daily basis to help them get better. And if they need post-production, we let them know we can provide that for them too. So what we're the service we're doing on Clubhouse is just letting people know about the new stuff that's going on, helping them with their problems, giving them advice from what we've gone through. Well, I'm going to ask you a question that has mm -hmm. nothing to do with audio. Um, Great. Yeah. <laughs> when, right, once in a while, okay, I use Ethernet cable to do podcasts right now. So I hook the Ethernet into my, uh, my computer right now. Mm -hmm. For some reason, the signal on the um, stream yard you know, next to live, it, it has a weak, weak, it goes weak and then goes full and goes weak, it goes full. Uh, why is that? Because no one is home. No one's playing a video game. <laughs> so what it's probably doing is if on your Mac, if you have the Wi-Fi on as well, no, it, it's I going it back and forth. No, I turn it off. I turn the Wi-Fi off. S smart. <laughs> So if you're Ethernet right in, that shouldn't be happening. Now, here, here's the other question. With your Chrome browser, do you only have one tab open? Uh, yeah, right now I just have, um, sorry, hold on one second. I had a two open. Yeah, one is just, okay, mm -hmm. I click, I close the other one. Still right now is one dot and then goes woo, higher and then, Go yeah, that, I mean, you look fine to me here. The, the only advice I usually, when I'm doing it with my customers, we use Riverside, but 
the the one piece of advice I give people is if you're on Chrome, just have one tab open, no other ones. If you need to get on the internet, just use Safari. Oh. And oh. And, and won't eat up the bandwidth. But as far as I'm seeing here, everything looks good to go. Yeah. When I see uh, the weakness, right, and mm -hmm. then, um, then it look it looks my image looks fine. When I go back to uh, watch the replay, and I look fuzzy, <laughs> so that's why I made Sherry is in the uh, audience. Hi, Sherry. You know Sherry Grant, right? You helped her. She's a pianist from New Zealand. Absolutely. Wow. Yes, Sherry. I love I love Sherry's yeah. playing. We've helped her. Yeah. In the one of the other rooms that we do on Clubhouse, the I can't remember the name of it now. Uh -huh. The sound check house. That's it. Sound check. So people would come into that house, and I'm a member. I, I help when I can, and mm -hmm. we help people set their things up and get things sounded good. So yeah. 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 Hello. She's uh, playing concert. She's doing a tour. Yeah. So um, l let's move on. Hopefully, I'm not too fuzzy. So. So you had an interesting background and you try so many instruments. Now, as a mastering engineer, um, I, I still myself uh, appreciate live performance, right? Because it's live. And when someone make a record, a CD, of course, it's, it's great. Uh, the experience of listening to it is great because it's, it's perfect, almost perfect. But um, what about you? How, how do you... Think about live uh, performances. Do you still enjoy that, or you always have a very critical ear and you say, "Oh, that's a mistake. Oh, I sh that should be played better." <laughs> How do you do so, there's a couple answers to that. So the first answer is, uh, you, I don't know if you could see in the back of my shoulder here. I have an actual switch on the back of my shoulder, so I turn it on and off. So yes. turn on engineer turn off engineer be regular human being <laughs> so i had to learn and develop that because as you so eloquently stated when i was a lot younger just starting out i wasn't fun to be around my friends would be like just can't you just sit here and enjoy it no you know that's out of tune this is too loud who the hell is mixing this blah 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 blah, blah. <laughs> so i had to develop that number one is just turning that off so it's like i'm here because i do i started out I, and i haven't done it recently for very for obvious reasons but i used to do a lot of live sound so i was a live sound engineer mixing live shows because mm -hmm. think about the control it's like okay i need it to sound perfect well if i'm mixing it it's gonna sound perfect right mm -hmm. so i did a lot of live sound but back to your point is as i've matured and gotten better at my job and realized that it's about being in the moment. It's about being in front of people. It's about the energy of the room. It's about the performer interacting with the audience. It's about energy going back and forth, being in that moment. So you would know better than anybody. Let's take Mozart's Requiem, for example. The sheet music hasn't changed since it was helped and completed by someone else, right? Because he, he died. But... Oh yeah. The sheet yeah. the sheet music's the same. It hasn't changed. So why are people still playing it live? Why are people still recording versions of it? And why do people like to listen to Mariner's version of it as opposed to other Saint Martin I forgot the is it Saint Martin? Yeah. One like to li I that's my favorite version. Why do people want to listen to certain version performances of sheet music that hasn't changed in hundreds of years? It's because it's in the humanness, the interpretation, the performance, and the emotion that that player can interpret it and give that feeling to an audience. The conductor. So, conductor. As well, right? As well. You're absolutely right. So when we're talking about a live situation... It's it's about the interpretation of the music. It's about being in the moment. It's about the energy. And it's the energy from the performer. Again, nothing. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But, you know, when you're on stage, and I do perform a lot. I play, I play my own music, electronic music. So when I'm DJing and playing other people's music, but now I'm mostly playing my music when I perform, 
And it's about the energy you have and you give it out to the audience and then you get it back and then it's a symbiotic relationship. And you can't mimic that with recorded performances because the goal of the performance, if you're doing overdubs and all that sort of thing, is you're trying to get the perfect take. If you're recording a live concert without any editing, you can still capture that, but it's not exactly the same because the air when you're there in the room with the energy actually happening, it's very different. So mm. I'm all about the live performances. Mm. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So when you mix music um, these days, what kind of genre of music do you mostly work on? It's, it's, uh, it's electronic music. So the genres can vary. Uh, when I'm mixing, so I'm mixing a lot of electronic stuff. So we're doing trip hop, we're doing drum and bass, deep house, tech house, and sort of anything in between, as long as it's electronic and, you know, doing a lot of stereo, but I've been doing a lot of Dolby Atmos currently. And, you know, that has just opened up a whole range of possibilities. But as far as the mixing, any genre, um, as long as it's mostly electronic and that's the music I play on my radio shows as well is electronic music. Awesome. Do you have any, um, things you would like to share any audio stuff like you, you want to share or you just tell people your, 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 uh, handle, I guess website, you have a couple of websites, right? Yeah. So, so my, my website is my name, right? It's mm -hmm. Sean Savage and then dot CA cause I'm in Canada Mm -hmm. And there you'll find uh, all my music. You'll find my radio shows. You can listen to them live on the website. I have them there. There's a little player. It's really cool. And then my my company is AR Media, and that's armedia.ca. If anyone's looking for help with the post production for their audio, um, that's where my my employees, my company, and I we can help you out there. And you know, you can find me, my handle on all social media. It's just The Mix Sessions, and you can interact with me that way. But that is sort of the places where you can find me. It's at the point now where I'm starting to get back into promotion and, and social media and that sort of thing. But, you know, having been so busy helping people and doing a lot of stuff in the background, you know, sometimes it's kind of hard to stay up on that. And I, I don't like to be handcuffed to my phone. Mm. Yeah, that's very smart. So I find 11 people out of 10 friends, they don't know who is, what is Clubhouse. So, so how did you get out? And how, what do you find uh, for yourself is helpful, or overall, the value of Clubhouse? So I had a very interesting an initiation intro slash introduction into Clubhouse. And, it, you know, I think we all probably have one of these friends who's just always up on the new things and wants to connect everybody and, hey, let's go out. There's this new thing. Come on. Come on. You're no fun. So that was my friend, the, the one friend. And she told me about Clubhouse. And I, I went, nah, it, it doesn't sound. But then she gave me an invitation. And I don't know if you remember back when it started, like it was hard to get an invite. And she got an invite, and this is like an exclusive thing. People were selling invites online for like hundreds of dollars, and it was Mac Mac operating system only, so it made it even more exclusive. And you know, being in the music industry for the time I've been in, I went, okay, this might be interesting. And she brought me into a room, just the two of us on Clubhouse, and she took me through the whole thing. And I went, okay, this has the potential to do something. So then I started looking for all the people I knew in the music industry, and then I followed them all. And then I went into a couple of rooms, and I heard people talking about stuff that I do, audio engineering. And then I tried to get onto the stage to, to talk with them. And back then, there would be a thousand people in every room. And there would be like a hundred people on stage. It would be insane. And I would never get on stage. You'll never get to talk either. Yes. And that was the whole point because here's the key thing. 
a lot of what these people were saying was wrong. The information was wrong. And I thought to myself, again, being a professor of this stuff and, and doing it for a living, I want people to have right information. I don't want them to have the wrong information. And then I went, you know what, This that kept happening over and over again, where I, I wouldn't get on stage or people were saying wrong things. And I just decided, you know what, I'm leaving this app. But right before I did that, I happened to be at a music conference. And at the time, it was an online music conference. And in one of the rooms, uh, is it Pete? I forgot his name. The the owner, the, there's two owners of, of Clubhouse, right? The founders. And he was in this conference room and he was talk he was talking about Clubhouse. So I went to the virtual conference and I, I listened to what he had to say. He was there with the the guy who did the Lullaby Club and the two of them were talking because that was really big, the Lullaby Club on Clubhouse. And I was talking to him and I I, I told him, I said, you know what? I, I tried the app, not really having it. I told him my experience. And he said, you know, that's okay, Sean, you know, but do me a favor. He goes, he goes, before you leave, go back, even go tonight, and just go into the smaller rooms. Go into the rooms where there's maybe 10 people or five people and, and see what your experience is. And if it's not any different, then you can leave. So I did that, and I went into just really small rooms. I was able to get on stage, but then I was able to talk to people and connect with them and I connected with this one guy in England and we were talking for like four hours. Wow. And I went, hmm, <laughs> this is what this is about. Mm. So I went back and I unfollowed all the people from the music industry because guess what? I know them already. Mm. Why am I following you if I know you're ready? And I, I changed my mentality, my approach to Clubhouse. I want to meet new people. I want to discover new things. So then what started happening is I would go in to not the audio rooms. I went into all the spiritual rooms and I connected with so many people because I am very spiritual, but I don't share that side of myself very often mm. and made some great friends, some great connections. And then the same thing started happening with the audio stuff. So I said, you know what, let me make my own club, my own house. Now they're called houses. And let me just start giving people advice and, and helping them get better sound. Mm. And I, I have a company too called Words From Your Mouth. And what we do there is we help people speak and use less filler words. So I actually was doing that on Clubhouse for a while. I was doing free sessions, coaching people on how to use less filler words. I so, need that. <laughs> so we, we can we can talk about it later. Um, <laughs> but the the main thing being is the connection, the community, uh, recognizing that less is more in the case of let me connect with 10 people and have a great connection as opposed to barely scratching the service with a thousand people or more than that. So the community aspect of it has really, really grown on me. And I, I've made quite a few connections on there as far as people that I regularly speak to that I've never met in person, but I still, I actually do consider them friends because there's a connection, there's an ease there, and we we know each other and we're interested in each other's lives. So I'm very thankful for the app. You become a better person. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I can 100% say I have. Yeah, yeah, me too. I, I have met so many people. Uh, right now, Shakfin is here. Shakfin is Mark. Uh, do you know Shakfin? Hi, Nihama. I think I do, actually. Yeah. Can you see the uh, people who who are in the audience, like the writing on the right-hand side? So Shakfin said, uh, well. Oh, okay. I was on the wrong thing. Okay, now I see it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've been, I've been listening since 5.05. Oh, <laughs> we were late. Sorry. Yeah, it was double. Yeah, yeah, from the Podcast Pros room with John. Yes, absolutely. So yeah. this is me. My picture is actually moving, Sharkvin. It's not just... Because that, that's the other thing. You're used to just seeing someone's picture on Clubhouse. Uh -huh. And, you know, if they change their picture, it freaks you out because you're like, who is that? Yeah. Right? I you're very identified with their picture. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, your picture is very cool. 
you look like a rock and roll singer uh, with mm. sunglasses. And um, I think it's a good idea to keep the same picture as long as you can, because people I, do. It's like a, your brand. Logo. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so what I did is I do have the picture, but I just have different backgrounds. So it's the same and people will recognize it as me, but I can occasionally just switch it and the background changes. So it's a little different. Yeah. I started yeah. doing that depending on my mood. I would put the different color up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm testing you right now. <laughs> I have a <laughs> tuner. Okay. Give me an A. Oh, no. We can't do that. <laughs> what are we doing? Yes, you can. You want me to give you an A? Yeah. A. Three, uh, four, thirty-eight. I said for 38. There's a fork will go there. Try. Uh, okay. And you put it closer to the uh, screen just so I can see. Because I probably start out and then I, I'll get in. Okay. You see it? Can you see the needle? Okay. La. La. No, it's too low. La. I don't know where I am with that. La, la, la. It, the needle is not moving. Hold on. Okay, try again. Sorry. It, 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 yeah, I said wrong. Sorry. I, I didn't push. Okay, try again. La, okay, I have to go an octave lower then. Hold on. Put it back up. La, yeah, a little low. I'm I'm an alto, so I have to I have to go to the low A. That's an A. Yeah. So I so I I I gave you a B, right? So I had to go a little bit lower, but yeah, yeah. You I I started right at a B, so I just have to tune down a bit. But again, we're going over the internet too, so I forgive you. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, so tell me a little bit. Of how do you teach people? Like we, when we talk, when I listen to myself, I say, ah, uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you know. And some people, some citizen, you know, in this room, always say, you know, you know, <laughs> you know. Yeah. How do we get rid of those? So what we we call those discourse words. So a lot of people call them filler words, but the actual name is discourse words. And it boils down to a couple of strategies. So the reason a lot of people use the discourse words, the filler words, is a symptom of us having a very noisy society. There's always noise happening somewhere. Even back in other generations, your parents would have the radio on in the background. You'd have the TV on. There'd always be noise happening. And we've been accustomed to having noise. Mm -hmm. So a symptom of that is when there's silence, we think something's wrong. We get nervous. There's some tension there. And we have this need to fill the silence with these discourse words. And the other thing that a lot of people do is they speak way too quickly. So when you combine this anxiety with silence with speaking too quickly, what happens is as people are trying to process or think of an answer or answer a question, their brain's going so quickly, their mouth is trying to keep up, but they don't want to hear silence. So when you combine all that, that's how the problem happens. So now when we talk about strategies, number one, get comfortable with silence. Mm -hmm. What's the best way to do that? Just meditate. Meditate for a minute, a day, two minutes a day. So when you're having a conversation and you get to that point where you're... That doesn't bug you when the silence happens. Mm -hmm. You don't feel the need. The silence happens and you just... Because you're, you're doing the meditating, even if it's for a minute, a minute is all you need. Mm -hmm. So when you're having a conversation, the longest you're going to have a pause is maybe 20 seconds. That's way shorter than a minute. You can handle 20 seconds because you're doing a minute. So don't worry about that. 
And when you slow down, you're going to get time to think about your responses. And a very big problem so many people have is they're not engaged in the moment and they're multitasking. And a cor- you know, contrary to popular belief, we as human beings, we cannot multitask. But the, the, the time difference between us switching tasks is so small, we think we can multitask. So you can't speak and listen at the same time. And be comfortable with silence, slow down, but then just do one job when you're having a conversation. So we're having a conversation right now. So right now I'm speaking. When I stop speaking, I'm going to be listening. I'm not, when you speak, I'm listening to you. Mm-hmm. I'm not thinking about my response. And here's the, the bad thing that everyone else does. I'm not just waiting for you to stop talking so I can blurt out my answer. I'm just doing one job. I'm the listener. Then if you ask me a question, I think about the answer and then I give you the answer. So it's speak, listen, speak, listen. It's not speak. I'm not listening. Are you done speaking? Now I'm going to talk. So those would be kind of the three strategies. Get comfortable with silence, slow down, and do one job when you're having a conversation. (laughs) That's good. That's very awkward. Mm, ah. So, yeah, I should catch myself also when I listen to myself interviewing people or um, uh, talking on Clubhouse. I have all these noises I make, yeah. And it's actually pretty, um, uh, what do you call it? What's the word? Um, annoying, actually, <laughs> right? Um, uh, he, I did that. So, I well, I, I have one thing to add to, and, yeah. and I'm not just saying this because we're on here together, but this is just a general feeling I always have, mm-hmm. is anyone who's not speaking in their native language, I can just give them an applause because it's not an easy thing to do. And a lot of people take that for granted you, the fact that someone's native language is, is something else, <clears throat> but you have to speak English, you have to converse in English to the majority of the world, and that you're doing that, I know, and a lot of people say, you know, the best way to learn a language is just go to that country and you'll be forced to learn it. And, I, you know, I haven't had the chance to do that, but anytime I hear somebody not speaking, who's not a native speaker speaking English... It, I just, uh, you know, I give them so much credit because for me, I and I, I speak a little bit of French because I'm in Canada, but I don't speak any other languages. I, I mean, I speak cooking, I guess. A lot of musicians <laughs> are good cooks, so I, I guess I can speak that. But uh, I just wanted to say that. That's for everybody, including yourself. Thank you. So what's uh, salvage your last name came from? What what? Where are your parents or your ancestors, can I ask? So that isn't my last name. That's my stage name. Oh. So isn't salvage means like somebody salvage things, right? Like, like, hear things. Well, the, my, well my tag is, is wild music oh. for your spirit. So I make wild music, savage, wild music savage. for your spirit, for your soul. Um, so that's my stage name. I'm not going to tell you the real name, but I can tell you the background to answer your question. Uh, so my my father, he is Scottish, uh-huh. and he's Afghan. So th- that's his mix. And my mom is Indian. So I'm I'm a combination. So I'm Afghan, Scottish, and then Indian. And I was born in England, but then I I. And I came to Canada, and I would go back and forth between Canada and England. But I was sorry, I was born in Canada, and I grew up in England, and I would go back and forth. So, was, and sort of my identity as a as a youth, and especially my musical taste, formed in England, and sort of the cultural identity I had was formed in England. Uh, and uh, you know, I don't have an accent because I grew up here, but I would go back and forth all the time. Wow, well, what an interesting background. Mm. You're truly a mud. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
<laughs> in, in a good way. Yeah, 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 in a good way. So um, do, do you think musically um, influence-wise, uh, do you think you're influenced by American music when you're, you know, youth, or you're influenced both uh, in Europe, European or England? You know, England has a really uh, British... Oh, has com a completely, completely England. Oh, England, yeah? England and Europe, you know, for the classical stuff, definitely Europe, obviously. Uh -huh. And uh, England, England, England all day. Nothing to do with the States um, until, uh, you know, I started working in the industry. But I still wasn't influenced by American music. It was a market for me. Mm -hmm. So even to that day, and when I started DJing, I'll, I'll get all the music from England, bring it over. So people, when people wouldn't know, I would be breaking it because they'd never heard it before. So to answer your question, it's Europe and England. And Canada, to a certain extent, but we're a very young country. We have a very short history. That being said, if you look at all the top artists in the world right now, overwhelming majority of them are Canadian. Yes, yes. Not necessarily in classical music, though, right? More like a pop music. Correct, so, yes. Yeah, not, not classical, but yeah, absolutely. Emery. Uh, that that Sim Simpson guy, uh, what's it, this? The singer, the the male, what's his name? Uh, uh, Simon, Simon, whatever. Yeah, he's really awesome. Um, yeah. Anyway, so speaking of a Canadian and American, um, I have a kind of very uh, elementary question. First of all, Americans and uh, Canadians all speak English, right? And um, I cannot hear the difference between your English and people around me. <laughs> so there, there's a couple of things. We're very, we're still part of the Commonwealth, so we're still technically a British colony, right? And there's a lot of that history, good and bad, as we've heard recently with the natives and the reserves and all that stuff, and the the, the Catholic Church. But we're we're still a colony. Our history is British and French in Quebec and France. The best way to describe it, because I do, you know, I am on the radio and I do voiceover work as well, is a lot of people describe that Canadian accent as a non-accent, right? So the only way you can distinguish it was, is with certain words and certain spellings. So I say process. I spell color with a U. Ah. Uh. Right. There, there's certain words, the, the whole A thing and all that stuff that may slip out occasionally, but it's not indicative of Canadian. Uh -huh. But what you'll find with Canadian is sort of the lack of an accent. So think about somebody playing right on the grid with no push or pull because there's no groove to it. Right. So a, most Canadian accents are just straight. Mm -hmm. So there is no accent really. But with certain words. You'll, it'll definitely pop out for sure. Interesting. Less regional. Yeah. But when you do hear regional accent in Canada, it's very obvious. And then, you know, when you go to the States, there's obviously it's bigger and there's more regions. So there's more varied accents. You can tell right away North Mississippi, South, New York. Uh, you can hear Jersey. You know, you can hear those accents. Here in Canada, we have maybe two or three specific accents. So like Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. and Quebec for sure is a French accent speaking English. And there's probably a couple other ones, but it's a lot less. And, you know, we're, we're, we have a big mass, but our population is very small compared to the, the land mass we have. Very good. Now, uh, speaking of your podcast, uh, can you tell us a little bit? Um, I don't really understand when you say podcast, right? Some people have one podcast, then they have a subdivision, have seven other podcasts. So why is that? And do you have like a gazillions of a podcast talk about different subjects? So when I'm helping a customer, you know, we help them get the broadcast quality sound for their podcast. So I have three houses on Clubhouse and they're, they're divided into some different topics. And I created a podcast. It was called I Talk to Trees. So I created it. We're, uh, so just so everybody know, I'm going to be relaunching it 
fairly soon. But I created it, and it's it, as you can tell by the name, it's I Talk to Trees. So if you hear that name and you think it's crazy, then you're not going to listen. You're not my audience. When you hear that name, I Talk to Trees, if that piques your interest, you're the person I want to listen to the podcast. So I created it, and then I realized before I was going to release it that I'm not that same person anymore. When I recorded it, I was at a different stage, and I had quickly evolved. So I said, you know what? I'm not going to release it. So I held on to it, and we're going to have it evolve. But because I'm on the radio and I'm helping get a lot of other people with their podcasts, that's what I do. But I do have, I created another podcast and it, I didn't tell anybody about it. I didn't promote it. I didn't do anything. I just created it and I released it. And what you're referring to, I'll talk about what it is in a second, but it's a different way of using the platform of a podcast, which is when, when I do tell people about it, they go, well, that's not really a podcast. Well, I said, yeah, but I'm using the platform in a different way to, to very great success. So typically, normally, what people think of podcast is what we're doing here, whether it's video or audio. We have a conversation, it's recorded, it gets released, and then people can watch it back or listen to it, and it's delivered via an RSS feed. And you you follow the person, you don't subscribe they changed the wording. Subscribe used to mean you follow, but subscribe means now you're paying and it's behind a paywall. So the new word is follow. So they'll follow the podcast and when a new episode comes out every week or two weeks, click on it, listen to it. There's another type, so that's sort of the asynchronous version of it where you can consume it whenever you want or just go on a regular schedule. And what some people do is they do seasons. So they'll do like 10 episodes, and see you later, folks. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next season. Very much like a TV show. So what I did, and I've been doing my research, referring back to sort of my spiritual side, I realized that a lot of people who do the sound healing and they do the healing bowls and a lot of these other things, I noticed that they were out of tune. And I and what I mean by that is they said it's for this chakra. And I would go, I'm not really feeling anything. But then they would say it was this chakra. And then I did some research and then, well, this chakra should be this note. And, the, and I went, you know what? They're not really, they're out of tune. So I did some research for about a year and a half, as much as I could, and then experimented. And then I figured out the exact frequencies of every chakra, the three decimal places, hertz. And then I started experimenting and I did a lot of research into Ayurvedic and Nadi yoga, which is sound yoga from the Bhagavad Gita and Hindu tradition and all way back. And once I put that all together, I got all the frequencies for every chakra perfectly. And I tested it with some people and they loved it. And I went, Okay, so now I'm going to start selling this. We're going to make some money. And then I just heard a voice. Give it to the world for free. And I went, okay. So I, because I was in podcasting, I decided I was going to use the platform a little bit differently. So I just made 13 episodes. I haven't updated them since. We did it, I think we released them in May. And they're all eight minutes long. And it's the frequencies of every chakra. Plus I added a few more in there. I added the tone to synchronize your brain hemispheres, to help you concentrate better, then the the ohm frequency, and then soul star and earth star for you to ground yourself as well. And we released that and the, the it through the podcasts. So it we haven't updated, it's sort of like one season, thirteen episodes type of thing, right? And didn't do any promotion. I didn't tell anybody about it. Nobody knew about it. I just put it out there. And the response has been overwhelming as far as just people listening every day. And I could see people are putting it into their meditation routine and having great success. The emails and the interactions I'm getting were, um, you know, this is working. How'd you figure this out? A lot of different things. And it, it's called Chakra Healing and Brainwave Sync. Very simple name. 
you search it anywhere. And we're just, we're doing very well. We're ranking in so many different countries. We're in the top 10 everywhere. We have tons of listeners every day. And there's a need for that stuff to help people use sound, which we both love so much. And we know the effect it has on us. But to clinically use that sound now to actually heal things, as opposed to just helping us feel good, but it's healing us even though we don't know it. When you have a when you hear a great aria, you hear, you know, something in D major and you just like, oh, this is amazing. Sometimes we need some minor stuff too, right? When we're feeling a little bit down, but the tension, like you mentioned, is there. So that's how I'm using that. And then I'm creating a new podcast where I'm going to be explaining all of that stuff. So that hasn't launched yet, but we're going to be talking about how sacred geometry ties in with sound and Nadi yoga and how the science of sound can heal us in the traditions that have been around for thousands of years. Wow. That's a lot. And can you like type your um, podcast, just say at the private chat so I can put it in, in the, in the chat, the name of podcast. Yeah. I'll do it right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we are approaching six, six o'clock, although we start a little bit late today and um, yeah. Um, I wanted to read a, quote it's very interesting i read i, I read uh, these things on your um i just broke my glasses i uh, read these things on your uh one of your website mm -hmm. and you have a lot of uh great uh quote my son this is what you said my sound as uh, songs develop in a very specific way uh let's see uh they are meant to be danced to <laughs> very nice uh, i develop idea and only do things that feel right to me so tell me a little bit about that and you don't want to work on a song too long also yeah so when i first started out doing music it was definitely a control freak i was very cerebral and i was concentrating on success rather than actually creating the music. I was, when they say the cart before the horse, like I was way back, before I even started making music, I'm like, okay, it's going to go number one. We're going to sell this many. I'm going to tour here. I'm going to, and then, you know, it was very formulaic. I would look at what was happening on the charts. Okay, what key is that in? What's the tempo? What's the arrangement? Let me just copy that and change tweak this here and there and then when i release it it should be a hit not knowing all the work that goes behind that too with the promotion and the touring and ultimately you need to connect with people and once i figured that out because i was djing a lot i was playing other people's music yeah and i would see the effect it had on people and I remember specifically, I was in Berlin at the Love Parade. They don't have it anymore, but it was like 100,000 people in front of me. And I played this song, I think it was uh, God is the DJ by um, in Insomnia, sorry. Mm -hmm. it, that was the name of it. And uh, people lost their mind. And I remember distinctly going, I want people to react to something I made like this. Because, again, I was playing other people's music. So I decided to go and create my own music. And then I started doing what I just said before. It was very formulaic, no emotion behind it. And, and the stuff sounded like that. But then what I started doing was I started doing remixes for other artists. And I would slip it into my DJ sets. But it was my remix, like how I interpret it. So it wasn't my song from the beginning, but it was my interpretation of it. And I wouldn't tell anybody that I did that. And then I would see them reacting and realizing that it's about the live thing. It's about being in the moment type thing. And then I started making my own music. And I was lu I've was been lucky to work with a bunch of great pro producers and uh, big name artists. And the one artist, uh, one producer that I learned this lesson from was Daniel Lanois. 
And uh, he just said to me, he goes, look, your job is to capture the moment, whatever happens in that moment. And a good producer, a good engineer, creates the circumstances in the studio for the artist to express themselves in that moment. And he, he said, your job is just to hit record and get that moment, but you have to help them create that moment. So then I said, well, why don't I do this with my music? So I started realizing, okay, when do I work best? What time do I work best? How do I work? Let me just go off of feeling as opposed to constructing something. And then I just started creating feelings. And I started realizing, you know, when I DJ and I play those songs, even though it's not my song, what's the feeling that's happening? Why is everyone going crazy? What time of night was it? What key was that song in? That was the only thing I stayed to was the key because I know how important keys are and as, as do you and how they tie to emotion. So I started examining, okay, what emotion do I want the listener to have? And then what chord changes? I have a key, but I got to tell you, when I discovered, I mean, this is elementary now, when I discovered you don't have to stay in the same key for the whole song, oh my God, what? Yeah. You can change the key in yeah. a song? Yeah. <laughs> and you, once uh, I started exploring emotions and keys, then I started writing from an emotional blueprint. Okay, at the beginning of the song, I want people to be contemplative. You know, in the verse, I want them to start thinking about it. I want them to be happy in the chorus. In the bridge, I want tension. At the end of the song, I want the, I want release. So I started creating moments and going after these moments. At the time, the technology was getting so good when you were DJing, you didn't have to play the song and just mix them. I would play loops on top of each other and just like play part of a song and then add a hi-hat on top and just let that go for 10 minutes and see how the crowd react. And then maybe add a conga, add a violin, you know, add another and pull it out, put it back in. So I was creating live in the moment and getting that visceral feeling. So I just brought that to the studio and I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to create live in the moment, hit record and just go. And I started uh, using... Uh, at the time, it was newer software called Ableton. And the re real cool thing about Ableton is they have an arrangement window and then they have another window where you can just start performing things and just hit record. So you don't have to lay everything out, eight bar, four bar, 12 bar. You just hit play and when you feel like it, add the new thing. So maybe it's 11 bars. Maybe it's three. God forbid, maybe it's 29. It's not a multiple of eight. Mm -hmm, yeah. You go by feeling asymmetrical so, and and then changing multiple key changes and then time signatures oh my god everything doesn't have to be in four four right so that's how i discovered that developing it and not tr i don't want to intellectualize it because like i said it robs it of mm. of the uniqueness and the beauty of it Right, right. The, the symmetrical music making uh, actually uh, more or less at uh, classical era, which is a, a Mozart or early Beethoven and Bach, of course. Um, and, and later on, I, I would say starting 19th century, maybe middle of it and starting later 19th century. Definitely the composers are so much, I'm talking about classical sense, as composers are so much free and they just want to rebel. You know, they want to do something different. And by the time it's 20th century, of course, you know, it's it's much more innovative. And uh, I don't know if you heard about a guy, American guy called John Cage. John Cage, he, yeah. yeah. So he considered the street noise is music. And one of his composition is he had a 12 uh, person, 12 people uh, play radio on the stage. And they just tune the radio in different stations. And there's a conductor conducting. Interesting. Yeah. So it's a very, very, uh, what's a landscaping? Yeah. Um, mm. yeah. It's called landscaping number one, number two, two of them. And then there's a very famous one called four minute, 33 second. That piece, when I bought the music, right, you open the sheet as a blanket. And then it had explanation how to do this. First movement say, 
hypothetically, okay, I'm not correct. First movement, one minute, 33 seconds. Uh, second movement, you know, two minute. Last movement is whatever, you know. Yeah, so yeah. The combination, right? What what you do is uh, you can play with any instrument. So I saw a orchestra play and the conductor comes on. I had his, uh, you know, a little clock in front of him. So he started to you know, conduct. Then, then he's silent. So basically the whole piece, four minutes, 33 seconds, has no sound, has no music playing. What's the whole purpose, right? Hmm. What's the whole purpose? It, it, it's the same thing I tell people when they ask me, you talk to trees, do they talk back? I'm like, well, it's the same thing when you go to a, an art museum and you see a white canvas with a black dot in front of it. However you're interpreting that, it's it's bouncing off of there. It's you reflecting onto it. So when they ask me, do the trees talk back? I say, well, it depends what I'm saying to myself. So it, it, I would assume it's a very similar thing where you're using it as a way to reflect off of that thing to contemplate about you and, and look inward. I interpret is when you perform on stage, right? Depending on what state, depending on what circumstances, there will be sound happening at the when uh, people may be giggling. How come they're not making music? How come they don't play? And then you'll maybe in like New York City situation, you'll hear a siren moving back. Maybe mm -hmm. or if, if it's a cheap hall, right? You you can hear outside, or somebody drops something on the floor. So I guess to John Cage, that is music. At the moment, each experience is different, and uh, each performance is different. And also, it's a controversy, right? The controversy itself is creating something that makes him, I guess, uh, you know, satisfy, I guess. Well, I remember learning, and this was a great lesson for me too, is when you're talking about the groove of a song, that it's the space in between the notes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's not the notes. Mm -hmm. It's the space in between it. So it's the sound of ohm. It's the ether. It's the sound of the universe, which is always there. And it's like, okay, well, who are you to cover it up all of the time? You know, partake in it sometimes. So well said. Should we, um, you're, you're very visual, not only you, you are very, um, or I guess oral, right? Is oral. Yep. A-U-R-A-L. Yeah. And when you saw me for the first time, which is uh, just uh, an hour ago and you said something like, uh, you said something like in my shirt. Oh, I loved your shirt. I wanted to hear the story about that. Cause I love the pink. I love the turquoise. <laughs> I just, and you know, the horses. Yeah. So I, this also shows how ancient I am. This is a, here it says Jackson, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, okay. Yeah, I went to Jackson, Wyoming in 1989 and attended a um, music festival. It's a pretty prestigious called Grand Teton Music Festival. Mm -hmm. And so I bought from there, but it, it's been what? Almost yeah, 40 years, right? And, um, I still kept in really good condition because I have a secret. I when I wash in a washer, I do not dry them. I I hand held them. Air, I air dry. Well, here's the other thing that I do is obviously I'm, I I wear I wash the synthetics and the cotton separately, but I put them on delicate, and then I don't put them in the dryer. I put them on the the clothes hanger. Air, mm -hmm. air dry everything yeah. and and things like that with patterns uh, turn them inside out oh okay but so in in the washer it doesn't get it this doesn't happen in the washer right where the yeah. logo gets oh, okay. i just put them inside out oh okay that's another thing i should be pay attention but that's pretty amazing right yeah absolutely i i have a couple of shirts like that too that have survived absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah. I cannot throw that way. Yeah, it's nice. So thank you for noticing that. And all right, so we're we're good. We're good. Should I do a, a short uh, rapid fire with you? And then Absolutely. Can... Okay. Absolutely. Let's okay. do it. Favorite color? Burgundy. Favorite classical composer? Mozart. 
do you watch TV? Do you have a favorite current TV series? Outlander. Oh, I love it. Oh my God. Oh, when I watch it, I, I want to be in it. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's, Season seven. It's it just started. So it started? Oh, yep. oh that's um, I, I can't get anything done now. <laughs> All right. So what's your favorite uh, social media? Not being on it. <laughs> if if I were to say, I mean, you could say social app. It it, it would obviously be Clubhouse. Okay, yeah, that that's fair. You know, otherwise I won't meet you. Um, what is your uh, favorite vegetable? Broccoli. Um, if I were take you for a happy hour right now, what would you order? What would I order? Sweet potato fries. <laughs> no, no. Happy hour means drinking. <laughs> no, no, I know. Oh, okay. But I, I, I'd be at the bar, right? Yeah. So it'd be sweet potato fries. And as of right now, it would be water. So I, I don't drink alcohol anymore. But to play along, my go-to would always be Guinness. Guinness? Guinness. The beer. Guinness beer. The one from Ireland. Oh, okay. I thought it was a so, so the, I, I'd get a Guinness beer and probably sweet potato fries and have those two together usually when I go to happy hour. And uh, then probably tequila uh, because you get the high, but you don't get the, the hangover. Mm. But again, playing along with the answer, but I don't, I don't drink anymore. I cut that all out and I've noticed a massive difference in my health as well. Good for you. Good for you. Um, now, American food, when people say American food, it's like we think about hamburger, fries, you know, stuff like that. And what is a Canadian food? Poutine. What? Poutine. What's that? It's French fries with oh. gravy and then cheese curds melted on top of it. It's from Quebec. I and have it's, that. It's yeah. like a mountain, little mountain. Poutine, yeah. Well, oh it's it's French fries with gravy and cheese curds on it. Yeah. And that is kind of the quintessential Canadian sort of thing. I mean, there are other ones, obviously, but poutine's oh, pretty recognizable. I remember now poutine. I thought Putin, and then, no, that's not Putin. <laughs> Right, right, yeah, it, yeah. It's it's got an e on the end, yeah. Oh my god! So you know, the reason this is not rapid fire anymore. Um, I went out with uh, two of my friends from Hawaii uh, just last week, and then I saw someone order this thing, like a little mountain, you know. And I was like, "What the hell is that?" And then this guy told me, "What is it?" I forgot. And then by the time I order, I said, "I want what they have." <laughs> it's, it looks funny, so I ordered. But there's no way I can eat it by myself, even like four people. You can't mm. eat the whole thing. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. So anyway, Canadian. And if you had a choice uh, of uh, taking someone, you know, quite um, close friend out for dinner, what kind of cuisine do you take them? Thai. Thai. Yeah. Thai or uh, or Cantonese. Oh, Cantonese. Gen general general sao chicken. That's oh my, my go to. That's terrible. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, the hot hot and sour soup's good too, but. <laughs> General Tao, that's for, uh, you should, Cantonese, if you want like Cantonese food, uh, try their dim sum. Dim sum. And yeah, I, I, lo I love the dim sum as well. And mm -hmm. I love the surprises. It's like, what's this? Well, just try it. It's chicken something food. different. So, chicken yeah. Food. Try chicken. Yeah. That's good. I mean, All right. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I mean, you know, there, there's so many other great, great dishes but that that's sort of my thing and i'm trying to cut out sugar too so i know there's a lot of sugar in that and trying to stay away from the msg but it's it, it tastes so good <laughs> will make you brain damaged no i'm just kidding. no i yeah no you're not you're not wrong really oh yeah we don't use msg in my house but you cannot avoid when you go to chinese restaurant they probably do use it you know and uh, yeah, so what other question? Oh, if you win $25 million uh, lottery, what would you do? I am moving to Vancouver. 
That's what I'm doing. And then I am going to, I'm going to do that, move to Vancouver, get uh, a place uh, out out of the city, you know, in nature. Then I'm going to sell my company to my employees and give them all shares in it and let them run it and just give them that gift. And then, you know, take care of the, the people that need to be taken care of in, in my life, uh, relatives, that sort of thing. And then the rest, I would, uh, I would invest. And then there would be a big chunk that I would just give back, give away, give to people who need it. I actually have thought about this too. And I know there used to be this TV show. I forgot the name of it where they would just give money away. So I would do the same thing where I would have a private detective kind of look for people who really need the money. Aside from homeless people and that sort of thing, I'd be doing that as well, like making good use of that money. But, you know, the people who they get to that fork and if they had somebody help them, they could have been great. And that maybe they went that way. So I would just have like private detectives going and just looking for people and be like, oh, okay, this person had perfect grades and they got the scholarship, but they couldn't afford to get the plane ticket to go for the interview type thing. And it's like, well, here's your plane ticket. Go for your interview. So a bunch of those things, you know, starting out with me to help me be better, taking care of the people around me, and then... You know, when you have that much money, some people may think that's not a lot, but it is a lot when you think about if you budget properly. There's no reason I should have that much money. I don't need it. And there's other people who need it, and I would uh, give it to them. Wow, that's so profound. Awesome. I want some <laughs> to make my film, <laughs> my next film. All right, so so good to see you. And I wanted to thank uh, you uh, to be my guest and educate us and having a great conversation. I want to thank our audiences here. And if you're listening now or you're listening later, this replay will affect two minutes after we leave here. And I'm Qingju. I have a I have this live interview every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And I've been doing this for 240 times since March 2020. Yeah, three years ago. Wow, that's yeah. a great accomplishment. Obviously, great discipline. You being a musician, you know about that. So congratulations on that. Great. That's Thank awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, Louis is here. Hi, Louis. And we have uh, the the Yanni. Uh, I lost my uh, eye. Yaki Vegan. Okay, okay. <laughs> Yaki vegan. Hi, vegan. <laughs> Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Shark Fin. Thank you, Sherry. Yeah, so we're going to, how about you say last word, like we're in Clubhouse? On the, on, 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 when you're talking about life, uh, you know, live it from the inside out. Don't let society define who you are. Don't go from outside in. Because once success, the definition of it changes, you're just going to be following it. So figure out who you are. Go from the inside out. Life's about iterating. Just tweak, tweak, tweak. Do this, do this. And, you know, it's a marathon. It's it's not a sprint. Everyone's in a hurry. I don't know what they're in a hurry for. Awesome. Yeah. My last word is thank you again. And, uh, yeah, watch us, follow us on Clubhouse, and you're going to learn a lot on Clubhouse. And any any subject and what else uh yeah subscribe this channel if you can if you like us and also uh yeah watch my film i made a film uh with iphone 11 and it's on amazon prime and you can see it underneath my my uh, biography all right okay we're gonna close now thank you so much for being with us and thank you so much sean i'm i'm going to come to your room more often thank you all right, we're going to close. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.